Let me welcome our final speaker of the day. Simon Woodroff will be known to many, if not all of you, already. I just want to say a personal thank you to Simon, and I hinted at this earlier, because almost 20 years ago, Simon took a call from a random student at Leeds University. He agreed to support one of his events. He introduced him to his business partner, and he's become a friend and a bit of a mentor, although he would never use that word himself ever since. That Leeds student, of course, was me, and that guest speaker is Simon Woodroff. And let me just say about Simon, he taught me a couple of things in business, although I've never told him this before. He taught me business doesn't need to be boring, it doesn't need to be bland, and it's all right sometimes to be a bit cheeky. He's created some amazing things. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Elite Business Stage, the one and only Simon Woodroff. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, Ollie, I knew um, 20 years ago, and he hasn't really changed. I just said to him outside, he said he's become a little bit more, a little bit more gravitas. But I knew him, and 20 years ago, was, it took me back because it was just when the entrepreneurial thing was started. You know, so we were all, before that, you know, people like us, and I used to sit in seats like this. I was here, dirty bastard, he said. Um, you know, it, it, they, they were, it was a sort of spivvy, and suddenly it became cool. And Ollie was, was round at that time. He was just a young guy, and we started doing this television stuff. And t they, it was, I always used to say, we're the new celebrity chefs, you know, and it sort of started to happen. And it was a very, very exciting time. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd sort of just opened Joe Sushi 20 years ago, I suppose. And, um, but, you know, my ride to get to that point had been quite a kind of rock and roll of a ride. You know, I was, I actually left school with two O-levels. Anybody get less than two O-levels in here? <laughs> yes! <laughs> you know. And, um, and I think that to go off and do difficult things, which by dint of sitting in this room, you are thinking about doing or already doing or in the midst of, to go off and do something that is a bit like going into a war, you know, to actually, you know that you're going to have sleepless nights, you know that your fear level is going to be up here, you know that you could succeed, you know that you could fail, probably statistically more likely to fail, not such a bad thing to do. But there has to be something, you know, just observe yourself for a second, you know, there has to be something. I call it the grit in the oyster, something that drives you. And I know that when I was a kid growing up, I think we always, as a family, had a bit less than we were the poor relations. And, um, you know, I, I apparently, I used to tell people I was going to be a millionaire by the time I was 20. And, uh, you know, a bit of a loud mouth, you know, a bit of a cover up. And anyway, I, I, I remember getting to 20. And uh, it was the end of the, it was the beginning of the 70s, actually. And, um, you know, we all had long hair and life was pretty groovy, you know. We did all the things we did in those days. And um, I remember um, thinking to myself, you know, uh, I think I'll put off being a millionaire till I'm 30. And then I got to 30 and I kind of, go, we kind of went on, like, went through the drama. Who's in their 30s here? Quite a few of you, you know. But it's the, it's the most, it's the hardest decade of the lot. You know, and I remember going through my 30s and getting to 40 and thinking, it was a sort of tear your hair out moment. I thought, I have completely forgotten to become a millionaire. <laughs> and I dare say that a few of you have that, that feeling of a call to action. You know, that suspicion that you could do something more in this world. You know, I always used to think that when I was, um, you know, a kid at school, that the people who went out and did difficult things were very special people. But actually, I've learned, you know, business is pretty simple. The hard bit is people. And the hardest one of the lot is us, what we're doing. And I'll put business to bed. This is Felix Dennis, and it goes like this. Ideas, we've had them since Eve first met Adam. But take it from me, execution's the key. Good fortune, the truth is, the harder you work, the more that you sweat, the luckier you get. The money, go find a likely investor to get what you need, you toadies to greed. The talent, go find it.
but first wine and dine it. It's tedious work with a talented jerk. To win it, you've got to be in it, but never be late to quit and cut bait. Expansion is vanity. Profit is sanity. Overhead begs and it walks on two legs. The first step, just do it and bluff your way through it. Remember to duck. Godspeed and good luck. And I was early 40s, and I was in what I described as a sort of comfort zone, that I could earn a living just about, but I thought I could do something more than that, and I didn't like working for other people. And somebody said, you're in a comfort zone. And in my kind of image of it, I was like standing on the sand, and I took a stick, and I drew a circle around myself, and I was in this comfort zone. And when I stepped outside the comfort zone, what did I feel? What do you feel when you step outside? You feel scared, fear, very human emotion. And we're taught that when we have a bad feeling, we step straight back into the comfort zone. But I learned that if you stay outside the comfort zone, which is what you're doing here to some extent, you're taking the first step or you're maybe further along the way. But when you stay outside for a reasonable period of time, like the pebble dropped into the lake and the ripples going out, your comfort zone gets bigger. And I determined at the age of 40 that I was going to go and do something else. I'd been in all sorts of things. I'd left school with two O-levels, as I said, and I, um, I, was, a, a, I was a roadie. Somebody, everybody said, you know, if you're going to go and work, go do something that you enjoy. And I couldn't think of anything that I liked about work except rock and roll music. You know, so I went out on the road as a roadie, and I became a stage designer. I got to Live Aid in the 1985, which is a big year for me, because it was, I remember looking around and suddenly, um, um, all these sort of highfalutin designers were coming onto what had been my patch doing these rock shows. And I thought, I've got to get out. I'm sure none of you have ever had this thought. I thought, I've got to get out of this business before I get found out. <laughs> and I was lost for the second time in my life. I got lost a third time, and then I got lost in my early 40s again. And I was, um, I'd got, I was going to do all sorts of different things. I'd got my notebook out. I'd started to do the research. I knew that you didn't learn anything standing here and thinking about it. You have to get out of your comfort zone and get out here. And write down, I was writing down all these different ideas and things. And you can start doing a business just with a piece of paper. That's all you need. And you start researching it, put a bit of time and money into it. And I was um, actually, my dad always used to say, it's amazing who will see you if you go and knock on their door. And I was knocking on people's doors. and I knocked on this guy's door I knew from the TV business, a guy called Mr. Uehara. And he was a Japanese guy I knew from a television business. And he took me out to lunch, and we were eating sushi. And I'd always liked sushi. I'd lived in California. And I said, it just came to me out of the blue. I said, what about sushi? I said, you know, it was, it was a sort of mystery thing in those days. And he looked at me. It was this oriental silence. My dad used to say, always, always wait until the silence ends. And Mr. O'Hara said to me, he said, what you should do, Simon, is a conveyor belt sushi bar with girls in black PVC miniskirts. <laughs> and we never did the miniskirts, but it was, it was a moment for me. And it was before the internet. And I went out to research this idea, ideas we've had them. This is Eve met, first met Adam, but take it from me, execution's the key. And I went out to research it. And you can imagine pre-internet trying to do that and finding out about Japan, I found out. And suddenly, I, I, after a bit of research and a few calls, I got these envelopes coming through the door of my little West London flat. And they were sort of brown envelopes with little bits of japanese string on the back tied up and katakana writing. And I was tearing them open. I discovered there were 2,500 of these conveyor belt sushi bars in Japan. Nobody had ever heard of them over here. And they'd been going since the 1960s. And they opened one of these things, and it was in English. It was in English. It was in rather bad English, badly translated. And it said, how to start your own conveyor belt sushi bar with names, contacts, phone numbers, drawings, everything, spreadsheets. You know how much money you're going to make at the bottom. I thought, I, you know, I was holding it. Can I borrow this? I was holding it like this. You know, I was holding it like this. And I was going, I hope. I hope nobody else has seen this. <laughs> nobody knows about restaurants. Very neat writing Thank you have, you darling. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, and that's when the problems start. You know, that's when that voice, I'm sure none of you have that, but I have this voice in the back of my head that starts up because, you, you know, you, you, what are you dreaming about? You can't even get a washing up done in the morning some mornings, you know. You know what? 
And to delude, I suppose, to delude that side that says it's all going to go wrong and it's not going to happen. I, I had this thing that I call, I call it acting as if. So instead of saying, I'm going to start the world's largest chain of conveyor belt, sushi bars are going to be the new virgin, I'm going to be the new Richard Branson, blah, blah, blah. I say, all I'm going to do is I'm going to be an actor and I'm going to act as if I am somebody who would do something like that. And I remember giving myself three months. Three months is an interesting period of time, because three months is nearly 100 days. And if you just chip off 1% improvement a day, at the end of three months, you have 100% improvement. And at the end of that three months, I started waking up in the morning, and that voice was gone, quiet as a church mouse. And I've got this other voice that's waking me up in the morning. And this voice is going, you are going to be very, very rich and very, very famous and very, very successful. And fortunately, I've been around long enough in this old world to know that this voice is just as big a delusion as this voice. <laughs> but this one gets you jumping out of bed in the morning. And, you know, and I walk into the room, and because I believe it, because I've got to a point where I believe in something, you know, I... If there's one thing I've got, is, it's enthusiasm for a new idea. I can have an idea, and three minutes later, I'll be calling somebody, telling him I'm going to do it. You know, because I believe it, you cynical lot, you, know, you at least think he could be right. You, know, you can walk into a room at any level you want if you have confidence. And the confidence is such a strange thing, because it's like you can't imagine summer when it's winter and vice versa. You can't imagine not being confident, which I wasn't once, and being confident. But you have to act as if to get to that point. And um, so I went out to try and start Yo Sushi. And um, you know, I didn't have a great deal of money. And I just got divorced, so I had even less. And, um, and, and, and I, remember, I remember hearing people say, you know, what is common about successful people? And, you know, successful people come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. You know, look at you lot. You're all different. You all do things in a different way. You've got your own way of persuading people. You've got your own way of taking notes. You've got your own way of doing things. And they're all right. All of them are the right way of doing things. But there's nothing that's really common. That's why if you look on the self-development business books, they're all different. You know, they've all got different ways of doing things. But there's only one thing that I know that is common to all successful people. And that is this, that successful people, on a day-to-day, minute-by-minute, hour-by-hour, week-by-week, month-by-month basis, successful people don't go around succeeding all day. Successful people fail. They are willing to step out of this comfort zone and do something and fail. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I need money, and I need a site for my first Yo Sushi, which had become known to by then. Um, I'm going to go out and see three estate agents today, and I'm going to see three money people today. I'm going to fail six times, and I'm going to come back at night, and I'd fail six times, and I'd punch the air, knowing that only through failure was a pathway to lead to success. And at the end of the year, I had a site lined up, and then I lost it. The property company pulled out completely. And I was very lucky, because if I'd opened Yo Sushi at the end of one year, I'd have opened a typical Japanese conveyor belt sushi bar. I wouldn't be standing here in front of you this, right now. And um, in that second year, all the things happened. You know, we had the, with the conveyor belts, we had the chefs, we had the call buttons that you pressed, and they went, instead of going ding dong, they went, yo, I want my sake now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we had this, oh, I had all this stuff going on, and more, 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 more. And then I remember thinking, you know, how can we do, we're serving the drinks, on, the food on a conveyor belt, how could we do the drinks? So I remember, you know, um, I remember thinking, well, maybe we should, I wonder if I could get a robot. And this is 20 years ago. So this is like before robot had become a word like it is today. And somebody said, well, I, so, you know, and I don't know if you've ever been out to try and buy a sort of sushi drink serving conveyor belt robot. You know, it's not exactly you sell them on every street corner. And somebody suggested I go to a university. And I went to one of the universities I've got on the phone. And ended up at uh, Edinburgh University answering the phone. And she says, she said, this is the Edinburgh University Robots Department. How can we help you today, sir? I couldn't believe my luck, you know. And I got the technology that they had developed for a system for a robotics, early robotics, actually. And um, I married them with a company called Brilliant Stages who do the big rock shows, you know, the Rolling Stones Bridge and U2 when they come out of an, you know, all of this stuff, you know, because you, that's what I knew from, I was in showbiz, you know, so that's what I knew. And they, they said, oh, it's good branching out for us. And um, about four weeks before we opened that first restaurant in Soho on a building site, I watched this robotic 
and all the builders stopped and watched it as well. And I watched this robotic drinks trolley drive across the front of the restaurant and turn very, very slowly as if of its own volition and drive down the aisle. And my fear level went down, you know, because whatever you do in this competitive world, it's got to be great, 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 great. The standards are this high. But there's got to be a bit of ziz, but the ziz that's in showbiz is in every business in the world. You only have to listen to Ollie to hear the ziz. And uh, as this thing drove around the corner, it had the nine o'clock button pressed, and it said, move, because each of them had a digital voice. And they spoke, yeah, it's actually my voice, digitally done like a robot. And as this one drove around the corner, it said, move your fat ass. <laughs> it said, somebody's got a fucking job to do in this restaurant. I remember we opened, and I remember he hearing this American tourist. I was watching everybody reacting to this. And I heard this American tourist. He, said, he turned to his wife, he said, Joan, Joan, do you hear what it said to me? It's a robot. Oh, it's a robot. And I realized that if you change the rules, that you can do anything in this world, if you can change the rules. And I don't think there's ever been a better time to um, start a business. Well, I mean, my, my mum always used to say, there's never a, never a convenient time to have babies. And there's never a convenient time to start a business. But actually, I think there's more opportunity, especially as we go through all this change and upheaval in this world, there are opportunities. If you have imagination, if you have ideas, and if you can execute and if you can drive, drive them through. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty good time. So anyway, we opened that restaurant. And um, the first week, nobody came because I didn't have any marketing money. And in fact, I'd always said to people, ironically, and I still believe it to this day, for, for real startups, Forget the marketing. Stop marketing. Spend all the money to do something really, really interesting and really good, and then let people find out about it. And it took two weeks of us for we. I pulled the things down. We were in the middle of Soho in, in Poland Street, actually the side street, and I'd covered up the wall with all these orange writings, and you, I wouldn't let anybody look inside. When you took it down, you looked through the window. You think, what is that? Is it a restaurant? Is it a factory? You know, what is it? And nothing happened, and, and nobody came. To the point that I even got somebody to go and stand with one of those sushi things on Oxford Street. You know, oh, how embarrassing when I think back about it. But the second Saturday, I came upstairs, and there was a queue down the block. It was right, right to there. And that queue lasted for five years. It's like having a hit record. It was unbelievable. It's like taking off very tight shoes at the end of two years. Relief. And... Um, yeah. The money was rolling in, and I was running the business, so the money was rolling back out again. <laughs> and I'll come back to that in a moment. But um, on the front door of that restaurant, it said, uh, it said, Sony, Honda, all Nippon Airlines. And I'd got three sponsors, but all they'd done is Sony had given me some free televisions. So Honda had lent me one Honda Jaro canopy motorbike. And I remember writing them saying, I'm so grateful to you for lending me this motorbike on test that I'm going to make you my official sponsor. And if I don't hear back from you in the next seven days, I'll assume you agree. Of course, they're a big company. They never wrote back. So, you know, I had the Sony, Honda, all Nippon Airlines. They upgraded me once. That was it. But it sounded pretty cool, you know. And it was on the menus. Have you ever been to a restaurant that's got all these sponsors all over it? And I didn't, we opened, and I would had these private investors, and these private investors, you know, I opened, they wouldn't put their money on the table before I opened, you know. I had, uh, I put everything I had on the world, I got some very expensive leasing, I had some a government loan guarantee scheme, but the investors who were going to put up the proper money, I managed to get this thing open without them arriving. They were saying, oh, we'll do it next week, do it next week, and they never did a cash pick. By the time this Saturday arrived, I wasn't going to give anything away to them. And I remember going, I had an idea. I thought, I'm going to go and ask the suppliers who I owe all the money to, who had been doing the building work, I'm going to ask them if they'd lend me the money to pay their bill. <laughs> and I remember putting it that way to them as a sort of a bit of humor that never went to miss. And this guy, to my absolute amazement, two weeks later, he came back and said, our company is prepared to give you some extended credit. And that's actually how I financed Yosushi. And these people, these, these private investors, by this time wanting to sort of check they, they, were, they were out of it. It was a very satisfying feeling. And I asked the guy, 
couple of years later, I said, why did you, your, your company do that? He said, well, our managing director, you know, building company, right? He said, he's a hard nut, you know, no messing around. You know, he said, he stood up in our board meeting and he said, I went to that year sushi, very, very good it is. And he said, I think we should do this. I think we should give them extrinsic credit. It's going to lead to other things and it's very, very good for us and for our profile and everything like that. You know, it's getting a lot of attention. And he said, um, and anyway, he said, the money is totally safe. You know who's behind them, don't you? Sony, Honda, <laughs> or Nippon Airlines. <laughs> so as Mick Jagger said, you can't always get what you want, but sometimes you get what you need. Life is what happens while you're busy making other plans. And um, then we got a call from Harvey Nichols and Selfridges, and we started opening them. I make it sound easy, but it wasn't. It was tumultuous. You know, it was 40, 18 hour days and people were walking out and all sorts of difficult things. But it looked good on the outside and people were coming. And you know, the second restaurant is like having a second record and you know, all of that stuff. And, um, and, um, and, and I, um, I bought in, uh, we had an a operations director until quite recent, until a couple of years ago, has been the MD of Yo Sushi for many, many years and did a, lot, did a lot of the best things for Yosushi. I remember going to a, an awards show, the Katie's is what they have in things, it's like the Oscars of catering. And, you know, I was never really a restaurateur, I was more of a businessman doing lots of different things. Uh, Robin, was a, Robin Rowland was a, was a real restaurateur and he, he helped me build it really, I mean he did a lot there. And he's, I remember we were sitting at the table and it, they all wanted me to go up and talk on the stage to the Katie's, you know, to do a thing. And Robin said, why do they always ask you to go up? I said, because Robin, if you went up, you'd talk about the like for like figures for last year and it's boring, you know. And he said, yeah, you're right, you know. So, you know, if you can be a, if you can be, if you can present yourself, you know, the presenters who don't do it my way, they're quiet and sensitive, you know, different, different ways of doing it. But anyway, we went into, after five years, we needed money and it wasn't all easy. It looked on the outside and, um, so we went into you know the thing that I'd always dreamed about, which is to sell to, to a venture capitalist. And we, I went through all that whole venture capitalist thing and the lawyers and this that. And we, we ended up in a lawyer's office. I had to sign 39 documents, and I hadn't really believed it was going to happen. Robin had led the cavalry charge because it's my own money and it's everything I had in the world on the line. I still own 90% of the company at that stage, and I went into this um, meeting, and uh, suddenly all these lawyers who had been absolutely awful turned into very nice people. They opened the champagne. We had a few drinks. <clears throat> and they said, the money is, um, you know, is going to be in your bank account. And they said, where do you want, to put, where do you want the money? And in those days, we had checkbooks. And because I hadn't really believed it was going to happen, I'd never arranged for anywhere to put the money. So I pulled out my checkbook, gave him the sort code and the current account number. And he said, it will be in your bank account in 20 minutes from now. Amazing. And I remember being a bit tipsy and walking back down Oxford Street where I lived at that time in Fitzrovia um, from this meeting and the landscape was different and I'd signed a deal and I was, I was safe, you know, the pack of cards was still up there, you know, the house of cards was up there and I, I was safe. And I thought, as I walked past the ATM machine, 20 minutes I'll have a look, see if it's there. <laughs> so I put in my, um, my, my code and um, sure enough, there on the thing was a sum of money. That's actually is not as much. I was slightly ashamed it wasn't quite as much as it should have been, you know, but it was a get you out of card, trouble card. And of course, later on, I hadn't sold all the company. I'd only sold a small a part of it. And anyway, it was a big feeling of relief. And um, I looked at this number, and I was standing there for so long, but a queue formed behind me. <laughs> And there was this, this guy behind, he was kind of coughing and spluttering. And in the end, I turned around to him and I said, excuse me, mate. I said, copper, look at this. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, all of you here today, if anybody tells you that money doesn't make you happy, they're lying. <laughs> How are we doing for time, Ollie? Oh, he's gone. Yeah, we're, good time, we're good. OK, good. We'll just shout out. Um, so then, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, what's next? And um, um, you know, what do you do? I always secretly hope that Yo would be a, um, you know, a brand that could go into different things. Because when you, when you actually, it's interesting that if you look at brands that have gone into lots of things and done it well, you know, you look at Virgin, obviously, I mean, he's done it absolutely incredibly and had a lot of failures along the way. There's a guy who's had a lot of failures, nearly fallen over, but lucky he did them in the right order so that other ones kept it up. But you get Virgin, then you get Easy, but there isn't anybody else. 
I mean, virtually, there's nobody else who's tried to do it. So that's the crown that I'd like to take, is that Yeo would be the, the other one to do that. So I started looking at other things. People came up, oh, God, the number of things people wanted me to do. Somebody wanted me to go into the funeral business. <coughs> I said, what would that be? Because there's a distress sale, good business to be in. You know, nobody's in it. Not a bad idea, actually. He said, what, what, I said, what would it be called? He said, Yo Below. <laughs> So we had all sorts of things that we could have done. And in fact, we did do a series of bars called Yo Below, which is where we did. Somebody said, came up to me, well, is, who said, said they'd been to Yo Below? Somebody in here said this morning. Yeah, that we had, that's where we had the, um, uh, we had self-serve beer. We had the waitresses singing uh, karaoke in between the house music. And you press the button and you get a third of a pint of beer. And we had smoke extracting ashtrays, people before you, when you were still allowed to smoke. I, told, I shouldn't, probably shouldn't tell you this, but I told the Times. They said, well, whatever next? I said, well, they were talking about legalizing marijuana at that time. And I, said, I said, when they legalize marijuana, we're going to suck all the smoke into a special room and charge people to go in there and call it yo to blow. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, I started looking at, you know, at hotels and just to try and do something different. You know, how can you, my thing has always been, how can you reinvent something? And I looked at hotels. And, you know, we had a hundred pieces of paper and drawings and everything. I'm at my happiest. You know, if you want to be good at life, I'll tell you something. I, I think of one thing that I've learned is try, try and spend 80, 90% of your time doing what you're good at and doing what you love because you're going to be better. And I'm at my happiest if I've got a piece of paper and I'm drawing or I'm writing lists, or I'm putting the whole thing together, and I've got a people to bounce off, but mostly doing it myself. You know, it's good as an entrepreneur to do stuff yourself. If you take too many consultants on board and have too many partners, it gets too complicated. In the early days, you know, in the early days, being a megalomaniac, like I was, am, is a really, really good thing to do. But as you get further on, you've got to hand over. And that's what I did with Robin Rowland. I really handed it over to him to run, and everybody was surprised. But that's a very smart way of doing it, I would say. Um, so I started looking at um, hotels. And you know, if, I'd, if, you, if I'd done market research, you know, I'm, I'm a believer if I do something that I think is really, really great, people are going to follow. You know, you, you don't know from market research. You do know further on you can do market research. We do a lot now. But if I'd come up to you guys here, over here in the corner over here, you guys, including you, if I'd come in here, if I'd come and said, you know, uh, would you like to eat raw fish off conveyor belts with robots serving the drinks? You're not exactly going to say yes, are you? You know, you can't market research a market that doesn't exist. And the same if I came up to you and said, said would you like to sleep in a seven, seven square meter room with no natural light, which is what our hotels are, or when they first started, you're not going to say yes. But when people walked into those first hotels at Gatwick and Heathrow Airport, they said the magic, what I call the magic words, which are, this is so obvious. Why didn't somebody do this before? And you can't do that by committee. If you put a new idea, if I put one of those ideas up, when we did Dragon's Den, we had, we had a coffee break once, and we all thought we'd pitch an idea to each other. And we said it had to be the idea of the thing that I'd done. And they all pitched their things, you know, phones, beetle, health clubs, Duncan, or whatever it was. And I pitched conveyor belt sushi bar, and they went, nah, it's never worked, never worked. Because it wouldn't. But um, I started doing these hotels. And we, I remember building a prototype of the first hotel, this, this very small room with four-star luxury in it at a good price, flexible price. And, um, and we walked in and we went, it could be smaller. And so we now, today, we can do two hotel rooms for every one. And people, you know, it's really taken off around the world. So that's been, that's been pretty exciting. And then I started looking at homes. And Yo Home is the thing I'm doing at the moment. And we're on our fourth prototype now. You know, to really get to market, once you get to market with a completely new product, it becomes, you're in a race. So to try and get something really proven and really developed, I'm a really big, I, I like building things, but to prototype and prototype and prototype and get something very, very good so that it blows people's minds in my 60s vernaculars when you actually launch it. That's what we did at the hotels. That's what I'm doing with Yohome at the moment. Um, studio apartments that can transform. So the whole room becomes a, is a bedroom, and the whole room is a sitting room, and the whole room is a dining room, and the whole room is a party room, and the whole room is a kitchen. But in each of its states, it feels like it's that room. And uh, you know, not everybody would want to live that way, but I think they will. And then, um, so that's the thing that I'm doing at the moment. And then um, I wanted to do floating islands. 
you know, I, one of my things about Yo was that Yo stands, Yo wants to give to everybody what rich people have, metaphorically speaking, you know, to give, to bring the price down of things. So what the rich people, rich people have islands, private islands. So I wanted to do floating islands. So when you go, drive into the bay, you see a floating, you, you see what looks like a real island, but it's actually floating and it's made in a factory and it's delivered at a good price because you're mass, mass manufacturing them and put them into bays, protected bays all over the world. And I went to the Bahamas on a holiday and I thought this is the perfect place because it's very easy to get to. And um, I thought this is the perfect place to do it. And I found an agent who said, yeah, I think the Bahamas government would support something like this, but what you should do is to buy a real island first. Um, and uh, that's a stepping stone to doing it. I said, no, no way. There's no way that I'd buy an island. And uh, three months later, I bought this island. Actually, I offered him half what he was asking for it. And he said, they'll never take it. And I said, well, that's it. Take it or leave it. And they said, yes. And so I've ended up with this island. And actually, I will do the floating islands one day, but I'm obsessed with this island. And what's it called? It took me ages to get to it. <laughs> it's called Yotopia. Oh. Oh. And um, so I hope that, um, and I'm going to finish up and then we'll have some questions if that's OK, Ollie. Um, um, I hope that one day I'll be able to make a film and I'll say, you ate in Yo Sushi, you slept in Yo Tel, you live in Yo Home, now come and visit us on Yotopia. It just wasn't that fantastic. One more time, Mr. Simon Woodroff. Yes. Thank you, Ollie. Uh, oh, Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, we've got some time um, for some questions. So please, let's fire away. Let's get going straight away. Here we go. Well, I know they're going to come thick and fast. So please feel free to say uh, your name and tell us what your question is. And we'll do it. Uh, and when we are streaming, so technically it's, you know, on the record and all that. <laughs> no swearing. No. Okay. Tell us, and then we'll come straight down to you. Go for it. Hello, Cyril Thomas from the National Property Investors Awards. Property Investors Awards. Everybody at home, you heard it here first time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, fantastic uh, talk. Thank you very much. And I want to know, what keeps you motivated these days? Because you've experienced a lot of success. What makes you get out of bed these days? Um, as I say, I, I'm happiest with a piece of paper and an idea. And although ideas, you've had them since Eve first met Adam, but take it from me, execution's the key. Um, that's really what gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, what um, keeps me under the duvet sheets is not making money. You know, the fear of losing money at something is a much bigger driver to me than the desire for great wealth and pleasure. But I know that businesses have to make money. You know, you have to make probably double what you think they have to make just to survive. And if you keep going, you can, and you keep doing things as well as you possibly can, and you keep thinking about the customer and not your margins, and customer champion, and do the very best and be exciting and new, eventually you reach a tip over point. And that's how the world works. If you do so, I heard somebody on the thing this morning talking about championing the customer and bit wanting to be the best at doing it. And, you know, fantastic, you know, service. Very good. Let's come down. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Simon. It was great, um, your speech. Um, I heard a lot about, so I had the impression your motivation is around making money, right? Um, we had a lot of um, speeches today around talent and the value of people as an asset for organizations, and that people need a real purpose to be connected to a business strategy and to get to business results. And I wanted to ask anything else, like what is your purpose or was your purpose in creating your businesses? You know, I talk about money because you need to make money to stay in business. You absolutely do. And people who are dreamers who don't believe that. So I'm absolutely money focused. But no, it's not my motivation to do it. Um, you know, um, I'm not the best to preach. There's so many people doing, doing things well, but, you know, to work with a team of people. I, I always said to, I'll give you an example. I always said that the customer is not the most important person. 
The staff are the most important person. And in fact, you know, certainly in the retail business, I used to go into Harvey Nichols, which is our second restaurant, very highfalutin ladies and things, in high, rather difficult people as customers sometimes. So hopefully you're not Harvey Nichols customers. And I used to go in and get everybody G'd up before the service. And I'd say, I'd say something like, look, these people are quite difficult customers. So if, if there's any problem, give them a free beer, give them a free, you're empowered to do that, direct to the customer there and then, and you know, really be generous in, in that respect. And, um, if, and remember that if they're being difficult with you, it's not about you, it's about them. You know, it probably comes from their childhood or something. And I said, but if they're really, 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 really rude, tell them to fuck off, we don't want your sort around here, and I'll support you. And, our, and, Pitt, and my staff we used to go, what, what? He's telling us you can tell the customers to fuck off. And, but nobody ever did it, ever. But I, they knew that they could. <laughs> Wonderful. Other, other questions? Other, yes, let's come right over here. And I'm looking around as well, please. Fantastic. Thanks, Simon. It was Thank you. brilliant to hear your story. Um, I'm just wondering how much involved you are in your businesses now. Do you have fantastic teams in everything and just dip in and out? I was in the music to? business. And I used to see these artists making records and then taking royalties for the rest of their life. And I once met Mungo Jerry. You know Mungo Jerry? In the summertime when the river is high, you can reach right. And they play it every summer. And he only ever wrote one song that was ever a hit of any sort. But he earned, and this was like 30, 20, 30 years ago I met him, he earned 50 grand a year, which is probably 200 grand a year, now, just from sitting collecting the royalties from that song that gets played every summer. I thought they're onto something with the royalties. And when I first opened Yo Sushi, I had, um, I own 90% of the company. My childhood friend, Matthew Gibb, owned 5% of it. He'd put 30 grand up, because you needed that to get the government loan guarantee scheme. And a bloke I met on the street in the Paris put up the other 30 grand. And, um, and the bloke I met on the street in Paris, Pierre, he, he was kind of difficult, because you know, he owned 5% of the company. He wanted to come to meetings and tell me how to do it. You know, and it wouldn't be a good idea, as you can imagine, telling me how to do it. So in the end, and he, he was said, oh, you're taking too much money for your wages. I think they're taking 30 grand or something. And I said, look, all I'll do, Pierre, is I'll take 1% of turnover. This was when we had one restaurant. It wasn't a great deal of money. And he said, oh, yes, good idea. Yeah, OK, if I like, if my, I'll do well if it goes up. So I had a contract written that my revenue would be 1% of royalty. But it was written into the contract. And when we got to the first venture capitalist, they said they agreed to it. Beyond belief, really, they have agreed to it. So I've had a royalty from Yo Sushi since day one. And now, of course, it's a very large company, and it's a very, very nice royalty. So no, I have no control over Rio Sushi whatsoever. I have a very nice relationship with them. I think they're fantastic in what they're doing. And I do try and help from time to time, but I, but I have a royalty that, that, um, that's flowed through. And I've done the same with the hotels. I sold the hotels two years ago to do the same thing. And that, so that's become my model, is my model is you build something, you take a royalty, and move on to the next thing, because I'm good at starting things. I'm good at starting things getting people enthusiastic, getting people going, and then I'm good at publicizing them later on, doing what I'm doing here. What a great question. Thank you. Um, Alex Cash, how do you manage a busy mind? Because you have a lot of ideas, a lot of creativity. I struggle with um, you know, generating a lot of interesting ideas, but how do, you fo how do you channel it and how do you focus it? Well, there's two, two sides to that, I would say. One is, how do you focus a busy mind? Um, one is that um, I think you, I, th I alluded to it earlier, but I think you can start a business in an instant. If you have an idea for a business, you can take a page of that notebook or three pages and start developing what it would be if I were to do it and ban yourself, put a ban on yourself. You're not allowed to think about whether you're going to do it, whether you're not going to do it. You're not going to think about whether it's going to make money. You're not allowed to let that crazy mind of yours make up how you're going to you know, either be wealthy or poor or lose everything. But just do the research. And after a period of time, once you've done the research and you've got lots and lots of notes on it, you might put 100, 200,000 pounds into doing the research, knowing that you're not doing it yet. You're just 
going through the research process. So I think that's one way to focus a mind, because then you can have several things on the go, and they're fun things to wake up to, because you want something that you can get out of bed every morning, because you, I want to get that written down and get it all drawn or whatever you do. And the other side to it is that um, I used to say that on the one shoulder, on the one hand, I'm extremely serious about what I do. I want it to be the best. I want it to be driven. I want, you know, thing. And on the other hand, I don't give a damn. And that's as equal to this. Because if you get too serious about it, we're here for one life. And if you get too serious about it, it's too much. And I'll tell you something about getting older is that my mind is quieter than it's ever been. Uh, my mind was a bit like you're describing. You know, it was a dangerous neighborhood. You wouldn't want to go there alone. <laughs> and what I've learned is to slow down a little bit, you know, and uh, the very good tech, I'll tell you, the technique it sounds pretty mad, but a technique that I've used is stop it. Have you ever tried stop it? If you've got something you're obsessing about, it could be for anything, just say stop it. It's not stop it, you're an idiot. It's just stop it, stop it. Try and get some control over your mind going off because you know, then when you get under stressful situations, you can go through it. And just remember that it's not very important, any of this stuff that we're doing. And you don't have, you have no control. You know, the, of course, the Arabs are the best because they have inshallah, you know, which is God willing, which they use in contracts as well. You know. OK, we signed the contract. And you're going to stick with it. And they say, inshallah, God willing, you know, there's a way out. <laughs> So yeah, and I, as I get older, I, I, I think less. I'm talking a lot here, but in conversations, I hope I say less. I, I made a determined effort to just, because I always wanted to be that boy who was growing up, wanted to be the millionaire. I always wanted to be the center of attention. But I've made a determined effort, and I've definitely changed. And I listen much more, and I speak less. And I'm not, and I, if I have the story that yeah, I'm going to make you all laugh with at dinner, I don't tell it. And it's really, it's been very good for me because it's, I've made much more friends. I've got much better friendships because of that, you know, because it allows somebody else to be there. And I've got a quieter mind than I've ever had, which is very, is a relief for me and others. <laughs> now we're just into our final few minutes, Sadi. I see a question here, and I'm just glancing around. Please. At what point did uh, Honda, Nippon Airlines, and Sony write you and go, hang on a minute, what's going on here? <laughs> they never wrote to me. They never said a thing. Um, Mr. Uehara, who was the IHJ who gave me, I used to talk about him all the time. And I used to say, well, he was the, uh, the story I used to tell was true, is, is that he was the producer, it was in the days when we had Top of the Pops on television. And he was the, um, he was the producer of Japanese Top of the Pops, as Michael Caine would say, not a lot of people know that. What was your question? Oh, how did, how did I, I can't remember. can't remember where I was going with that one. Get you. No, they oh, didn't. they didn't, didn't exactly. No, it's amazing what you can what you can what you can do with all of that. But Mr. You know, Mr. Mr. Uehara said that um, uh, he he never he never really kind of acknowledged that all the publicity I was giving him, and I've suspected that he was sort of you know Japanese and the black PVC miniskirts might not have gone down very well with the wife, or something. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm looking around, so I'm just super quick fire, if you don't mind. Um, so many moments on the journey must have tasted pretty sweet, but if you, had to, if you had to call to mind a particular moment on the Yo journey that you thought, actually, this is just beautiful. Well, you know, that, that moment, um, uh, the second Saturday after we opened Yo Sushi, when we had the queue down the block, that was, like, mind-blowing. It was like, you know... But there have, been, there have been so many. But also, you know, there have been more so, there's been what I call showstoppers. You know, you wake up in the middle of the night, you know, somebody's not going to let you have permission or some regulator, you know. And um, I always say, um, you know, when you get to a showstopper, when you get to a brick wall, there's two things to do. One is go around brick walls. Go around brick walls. There's always a way. Always, that's what I've learned. However bad it seems, there's always a way. And build golden bridges. And golden bridges is about relationships. Because, and I remember seeing a guy, an older guy, 80 must have been, who was the uh, 
direct, uh, Institute of Directors, major director or whatever they called him, and he was doing a speech at the Albert Hall. And he said, as I go out at the age of 80, having been around this for a long time in business, I thought as a young man that if I could persuade people with rational arguments and a logical, cohesive argument to why we should do things, that I would get on in life. And as I go out, I've discovered that if I can relate to them and touch them emotionally as a person, that it's much more persuasive than the long rational argument. So if you can, if you, can you know, to be, you know, I've done some things, but, you know, to be a, to be a, a, a really decent person and, you know, and also, you know, you need to fire people, you need to do all of that stuff, but to be a good person is pretty useful, especially if people like you. It is a very, very good oil. It allows things you, you to get through difficult times. So, so Simon, my final questions, and I know Alana's going to quiz you for our uh, audience online as well. Hello, audience um, online. If you, went, um, if you went back to meet a younger Simon Woodroff in Poland Street as that first restaurant is getting going and gave your younger self one piece of advice, what, what would you whisper in your ear? I'll tell you what I'd say. I wouldn't give him any advice. I'd say, well done, mate. I really would, because I'm really, pr I'm not quite sure how I did that two years, but I'm really proud of the young man who did that. You know, bloody good on him. Also, yeah. and it, it, it is slightly self indulgent, but to this day, I have never worked out why you said yes to travel to Sheffield University on a wet Tuesday night. Because you were such a hassler. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't that. I think it was. I remember you once. being on the phone. You, he was full of it, this one. <laughs> full of it. Yeah, you were very good, that. but you were very good, very you good. No, I remember, I remember those, those times. Time. With, with, they were very good times. Because I was slightly older, and there's a whole load of young entrepreneurs like this, and Ben Way, and, and Michael Acton Smith, and mm. all of those guys. And they used to come around to my houseboat. I used to have parties for them. And um, it was a very exciting time. You know, the television was interested in us. And then, you know, Dragon, Dragon's Den, I very nearly didn't do. Because um, I didn't have a great, truthfully, I didn't have a great deal of money when I did Dragon's Den. Not, but the thing about money is that everybody either exaggerates how much they've got or, or minimizes it, one of the two. <laughs> and I think a few people didn't have as much well, as that right. at that time. But I remember um, um, they, they did a pilot of it, and I was kicking myself for, because they wanted me to go on it. And I said, no, I'm not going to do it. I wouldn't want to spend all that money. And I was kicking myself. And then they, I got a call from the BBC saying, we've had somebody drop out of the pilot. They're not working. There's a spare seat. Would you come and do it? And I went, yes, thank you very much. And that's how I got on Dragons then. And uh, we did that first series. And very exciting because we didn't know what was going to happen. And I remember it coming out. And it suddenly, you know, you reckon, you know, the, it was an exciting time, and people really picked up on it and were excited by it. Yeah. And I remember asking, going around all the dragons and phoning him up, saying, what do you think, what do you think? And I got to Duncan Bannantyne, and I said, I said, what do you reckon? He said, uh, he said Simon, he said, uh, they recognize me on the street. He said, I fucking love it. <laughs> <laughs> so I always say to people, if you're going on Dragon's Den, if you sort of walk up those stairs or how, wherever it is these days, and you go into the show. There's not five people aloft. There's not five people there sitting thinking, what's the next good investment I'm going to make? There's five people sitting, how am I going to look in this performance? <laughs> it's show business. It's show business. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. So good to see you. Thank you. Oh, hugely grateful to Simon Rudolph for being an epic end to our first day. Thank you. Now, and don't forget your hat as well, Simon. But uh, Simon is going to stay with us. <laughs> uh, one more time for the legendary Simon Woodruff, yes!